Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. I want to thank George for inviting me to speak on this panel, and I'm thrilled to be included with Drs. Preller and Carhart Harris, both of whom are truly leading lights in this nascent field of psychedelic science. Uh, this is a field that very much needs the rigor and intelligence that they bring to their work. I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes about some of my lab's work on ketamine and MDMA, and hopefully draw some lines between anesthesia, psychiatry, and psychedelic science. First, a couple of disclosures. Some of the work I'm presenting was supported by an NIH K08 award, as well as an award from SNAC. Some of my salary is supported by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and an industry grant from Insitech. I own stock in the Brave Neuroscience Company. My presentation does include discussion of off-label and investigational use of ketamine, MBMA, and psilocybin. All references, unless otherwise specified, are to peer-reviewed clinical and preclinical research. So psychedelics actually encompasses uh, a kind of eclectic group of molecules. Uh, drugs like MDMA, psilocybin, uh, ketamine, and S-ketamine are pharmacologically completely dissimilar, but they have a couple of unifying properties that make them so interesting. Um, number one is in terms of their use for uh, mental health disorders like depression and PTSD, their onset is rapid. So for example, ketamine, the onset of antidepressant effect is within hours. Um, similarly, psilocybin and MDMA, you will see effects within a day um, as measured in clinical trials. And um, this is really a sea change from the standard of care, which is SSRIs, where it takes weeks to see an effect. The other major uh, distinction from existing therapies is that single doses or a handful of doses have effects that substantially outlast the lifetime of the drug in the body. So even after the drug is cleared, the therapeutic effect persists on. In the case of MDMA, for example, um, patients can enjoy weeks, months, or even years of substantial clinical benefit uh, and remission of PTSD after one or two doses. So this is really a remarkable change uh, in the kind of options that might be available to patients in the near future. So while much of the clinical data still comes from small studies, it's very hard to ignore these unprecedented effect sizes. And the enthusiasm for new treatments for intractable mental illness like depression and PTSD has fueled these therapies rapid progress through the regulatory process. I've shown you some of the milestones they've hit here. I'd just like to point out that the future of psychiatry looks suspiciously like our own job description. Monitored care during intense pharmacological and physiological manipulations. Now, I submit to you that while these may be revolutionary, therapies are actually quite crude and far from perfect. In particular, MDMA and ketamine have a well-known abuse liability in addition to their therapeutic potential. Uh, and that represents a major limitation to scaling their use to the millions of patients who might benefit. Similarly, we don't know enough about who may or may not benefit from psilocybin. Some of these therapeutic packages involve a lot of psychotherapy, are unwieldy, and actually end up being quite expensive. So there's, there's room for improvement. And I'd argue this is why drug mechanism matters. Through a refined understanding of the neural circuitry and physiology responsible for these treatments therapeutic effects, we can ideally develop precision therapy for well-defined patient populations. So how do we study drug me mechanism? Our research group is approaching the problem in a bottom-up and top-down uh, approach. So we model specific aspects of complex human behavior in mice. We then leverage the tremendous genetic tractability of these model organisms to generate detailed understanding of the neural circuitry, synaptic physiology, and pharmacology that underlie these conserved evolutionary behavioral processes. And now we know mouse models have major limitations. So we're simultaneously pursuing questions from the human side. Mechanistic experiments in humans, I think, are absolutely essential as criteria to judge the validity of our models. What I mean is that the work we do in animal models should be used to generate clear predictions that are testable in humans. And similarly, the findings in human subjects should directly inform preclinical models ultimately leading to the development of precise therapeutic interventions for humans. So I'd like to highlight a couple of our key findings that illustrate the translational process. And I just want to focus on MDMA. In this study, we set out to answer one of the questions I uh, indicated earlier about MDMA, which is that while it has powerful potential to induce pro-social behavior, and that is likely the uh, 
the basis for its therapeutic effect, as you can see these, you know, its main, uh, this is a really relatively unique uh, drug effect uh, that's something that produces emotional openness, empathy, and may actually strengthen the bond between a therapist and the patient. Um, but it also has abuse potential. It's uh, most well-known as ecstasy, a, a party drug. So imagine if we could separate the neural circuits for these two behavioral processes, pro-social and drug reward. And that, that has obvious implications for future drug development. So I'm showing you just one of the experiments we did um, in this paper where we did just that. We show that there are distinct neural mechanisms underlying pro-social and rewarding properties for MDMA. And what you can see here is we have a three-chambered arena where one chamber holds an empty cup and the other one has, has a mouse under it. We inject this guy uh, who wanders around the three-chamber with MDMA or a placebo, and then we record his social preference by the amount of time he spends on either side. And you can see here, this is him uh, exploring and it's, this is his sociability over time. So what results from all of the work uh, that we did in this uh, the study is that we convinced ourselves and a few reviewers that there actually is a social preference that recapitulates one of MDMA's most important properties in humans, that pro-social effect. And we similarly modeled non-social drug reward and did a number of experiments to show that these processes require parallel, independent neural circuits. So this work has directly led to a mechanism-based hypothesis that is most definitely testable in humans, including a set of compounds with no abuse liability that seems to reproduce MDMA-like prosocial effects. So I also wanna demonstrate that we can take this approach backwards and it can be highly informative. So in this case, we're uh, talking about ketamine, which you're all familiar with. And it's typically described as an NMD antagonist, although we know that it has a substantial interaction with the opioid system and can potentiate uh, opioid analgesia and can reverse opioid tolerance. So Alan Chasberg, another mentor of mine, had a hypothesis that the opioid system might actually mediate ketamine's antidepressant effect and may even explain its abuse potential. So we did the human experiment. Uh, in, a, in a group of depressed patients, we gave them either ketamine uh, or ketamine with naltrexone and looked at their antidepressant response. And we found that when we pre-treated them with naltrexone in this crossed over study, the antidepressant effect was completely, was completely gone. This is a little bit uh, unexpected and generated a fair bit of correspondence. And I'm showing you this because this is one of the very few findings that define ketamines or any antidepressant mechanism in humans. This is how we should be tuning our animal models to explain this interaction between ketamine and the opioid system, which we clearly observe in human subjects. So how does ketamine interact with the opioid system? Now we're taking an approach in mice that assumes nothing about the specific receptor interactions. We're exploring all options. Ketamine may induce endogenous opioid release or it may directly bind receptors or it may interact uh, at an intercellular signaling level. So what we're doing instead of trying to probe these specific mechanisms is we're actually taking a step back and looking at the entire set of neural elements that are differentially regulated by ketamine versus ketamine and naltrexone. And I'm going to skip over a large set of details here, but what I do want to show is the possibility is that what we're doing is we're mapping the entire set of state dependent neuronal ensembles, meaning we're looking at activation of neurons across the entire brain. Every neuron that fires through this transgenic model, we can actually trap their activity. We can, uh, if, a, if a neuron fired, it will permanently fluoresce with this red, uh, red indicator. We can use the same technology to capture these ensembles and potentially recreate a drug effect without the drug. Now, this, again, in practice, obviously a much more detail uh, than I'm showing you here, but again, using a combination of optical clearing methods, light sheet microscopy, automated registration, machine learning assisted uh, cell counting, we're able to generate brain-wide cell counts attributed to each brain region, 500 different individual brain regions. And what we find is a detailed map of 
brain areas that are where ketamine's actions are suppressed by naltrexone or enhanced by naltrexone. And then we can go in and manipulate these individual brain regions to identify the neural circuit determinants of this ketamine opioid interaction. So I wanna shift focus to a, a final effort. And this really highlights how this drug class, the psychedelics, this idea of rapid acting uh, treatments with durable effects, how they might one day impact perioperative medicine. So in pre-op clinics across the country, we're very accustomed to diagnosing cardiopulmonary issues and intervening before surgery. And for the most part, that's uh, we're, you know, we're involved in identifying and managing risk to our patients that are posed by surgery and surgical stress. So what if we reimagine a patient's time in the OR as a critical period where we can intervene to modify the trajectory of a psychiatric disease? Now, historically, this hasn't been a major focus because even if we identified an at-risk patient uh, with a psychiatric disorder, there isn't enough time to start an SSRI or try more than one SSRI. So even though we know that mood disorders have a major impact on surgical recovery, it just simply hasn't been feasible on the surgical timetable. And that's what we're addressing in a clinical trial that we're currently recruiting for. So we're testing whether ketamine is an effective antidepressant when given during general anesthesia. And we're designing this the same way that the outpatient psychiatric literature has tested ketamine. It's moderate to severely depressed patients, non-cardiac surgery, same outcome, same infusion, same dosage. Uh, and we're following them out to two weeks. Now, we took a peek at uh, a couple of open label patients, and I'll show you that uh, in, in a minute. But I also, I want to, to highlight that, you know, this, um, this isn't just about a pragmatic trial to minimize symptoms of depression. This also gives us some insight into the mechanism of this class of therapies. Ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, they all have this general uh, pattern of, uh, of, of this therapeutic package. Patients are prepared, there's a drug session, and then patients integrate what happens uh, with, with therapy. And this has been a longstanding question in the field is, do you need to have that acute dissociative effect of ketamine? Do you need to have the psilocybin trip in order to experience the lasting benefit? And here we have a unique opportunity to actually test that hypothesis, uh, basically using anesthetics to eliminate the subjective awareness of what's happening during the acute drug experience. So again, with that said, this is just very preliminary data on our first five patients, and this is their depression scores before and after surgery. This is suggestive that there is an effect. And looking, again, these are EEG uh, gathered from four of these five patients, that there appear to be an EEG change that may be predictive of their next day mood effects. Again, I just want to emphasize very preliminary data and I look forward to sharing uh, more, more with you as our, as our study evolves. So again, this is you know, something we're obviously interested in modeling in, in mice. And with that, I, I want to acknowledge uh, a very large number of people uh, that helped make this possible from the Malenka lab, my own lab, and uh, various clinical collaborators. Um, so thank you for your attention, and I look forward to answering any questions.